Now that I'm an old man, I cannot look back upon Wait Until Spring Bandini without losing its trail in the past. Sometimes, lying in bed at night, a phrase or a paragraph or a character from that early work will mesmerise me, and in a half-dream I will entwine it in phrases and draw from it a kind of melodious memory of an old bedroom in Colorado, or my mother, or my father, or my brothers and sister. I cannot imagine that what I wrote so long ago will soothe me as does this half-dream, and yet I cannot bring myself to look back to open this first novel and read it again. I am fearful. I cannot bear being exposed by my own work. I am sure I shall never read this book again, but of this I am sure. All of the people of my writing life, all of my characters are to be found in this early work. Nothing of myself is there anymore. Only the memory of old bedrooms and the sound of my mother's slippers walking to the kitchen. Welcome to the first episode of Dust on the Road, the John Fonte podcast. Today we're going to be taking a look at the first book in the Bandini Quartet, Wait Until Spring Bandini. You've just heard the words of John Fante reflecting towards the end of his life on this, his first published novel. Wait Until Spring Bandini was published on October 10th, 1938. The novel introduces us to the Italian-American Bandini family, living in California with roots in Abruzzi, southern Italy. We meet Svevo Bandini, a bricklayer who is having trouble providing for his family. Svevo has a wife, Maria, and three sons, Federico, August, and Arturo. In debt and struggling to find work due to the winter weather, Svevo has a stroke of good fortune when he begins working for a wealthy widow, Mrs. Hildegard, who pays him to do a number of odd jobs. Both Mrs. Hildegard and her wealthy lifestyle end up tempting Svevo away from his wife and family, leaving them to fend for themselves through the winter. We also follow Svevo's son, Arturo, who is himself in love with a girl in his class, Rosa. Quote, All these years he and Rosa had been in the same class. Two of those years he had been in love with her, day after day. Seven and a half years of Rosa in the same room with him. The only thing he cared for, next to baseball. Arturo, like his father, hates the winter, especially Christmas time, and can't wait for spring so that he can play baseball again. Quote, It was going to be a lousy Christmas, and Arturo hated it, because he could forget he was poor if they didn't remind him of it. Every Christmas was the same, always unhappy, always wanting things he never thought about and having them denied. For spring, for the crack of the bat, the sting of a ball on soft palms, winter time, Christmas time, rich kid time. They had high top boots and bright muffles and fur-lined gloves, but it didn't worry him very much. His time was the springtime. With Svevo waiting for spring for work to pick up, and Arturo waiting for spring so that he can enjoy life again, it's somewhat up to the reader whether the bandini of the title is Svevo, Arturo, or both. Fante himself, growing up during the Depression, said of his own childhood, I wasn't aware of the Depression. To me, whatever condition there was at that time was par for the course. We had no reason to be as poor as we were, but we were poor. My father was spendthrift. Prior to writing Wait Until Spring Bandini, Fante had already written another novel featuring Arturo Bandini, The Road to Los Angeles. You can find out more about that novel's complicated history in our upcoming Road to Los Angeles episode, but in short, all you need to know at this point is that that novel, despite Fante's growing reputation as a short story writer, was rejected by his publisher. At this time, Fante had also developed a strong letter-writing relationship with H.L. Mencken, who would become a key figure in Fante's writing career, and even his books themselves. Mencken, editor of the American Mercury, was such a frequent recipient of his submissions that he had had to recommend that Fante branch out and send his work to other places, as his magazine only took one or two stories a month. In fact, when Fante began his first attempt at writing a novel in the early 1930s, he wrote to Mencken saying that he would dedicate my book to you, depending on whether or not it is a good book and worthy of the dedication. Mencken was so familiar with John Fante that Joyce Fante, John's wife, remembered receiving a letter from Mencken after her and John got married, quote, sending me his condolences because I had married a writer. The full quote, which appears in the published Fante Mencken letters, has Mencken saying that Joyce will discover soon enough that living with a literary gent is a dreadful experience. (laughs) Joyce Smart, as she was then, first met John Fante in January 1937. Joyce's mother didn't approve of the Italian John Fante. Joyce remembered that he, quote, looked dangerous, was dangerous, Fante, meanwhile, took to writing her letters since he was forbidden from her family home. Joyce said of her husband that, I don't know how a young man in his circumstances reinvents himself as John did. He was very poor. He was beset with circumstances of heartbreaking sadness. His father had left. His mother was having a breakdown. His family had broken up. But he wrote. 
In spite of the fact that he was working hard at menial labour every day, he set himself two hours to write at night. On July 31st, 1937, the pair of them drove to Nevada to marry in secret, and in 1938, they were living together in an apartment on New Hampshire Street in Los Angeles. Fante remembered that they had, quote, a lovely apartment for $21 a month. That, he said, was where I wrote Wait Until Spring. Despite writing the novel there in Los Angeles, the book takes place in a town called Rocklin, which Fante said was really the town of Boulder, Colorado. I wrote Wait Until Spring, Bandini, Fante later said, because it was a boil that had to be lanced. Prior to publication of the novel in October 1938, Fante wrote to William Saroyan, who would win a Pulitzer Prize in 1940, saying, My book Wait Until Spring Bandini will be out on October 10th or thereabouts. William Soskin is putting it out. The book is, of course, a wow. Advanced sales already around 5,000, I'm told. Can you fix it with San Francisco reviewers? You got to do this for me, you bastard. I've plugged you all over the West Coast so much that I deserve some sort of return. I see you got a new book coming out. Before you write another, better look at mine. Fante also wrote to Mencken again in August to notify him that Bill Soskin is putting out my first novel in October. You might recall that this is the third try I've had at book writing, two other attempts having failed. Such a record measures perfectly with your comment that a writer should discard his first two books and get into print with his third. He added that he was, quote, very excited about my first book. I am jittery as I await the proofs. It is a wonderful feeling. When Wait Until Spring Bandini was published in 1938, it arrived with the following dedication. This book is dedicated to my mother, Mary Fante, with love and devotion, and to my father, Nick Fante, with love and admiration. Speaking to Ben Pleasance, Fante said that his father's profession was a bricklayer and a contractor. Later, Fante said he felt that my best efforts in all my books have been directed towards my father, his problems, failures and successes. The marriage of John's parents, Nick and Mary Fante, was certainly not without its problems. Writing about his father, Fante said that my old man wanted to be a singer when he was a kid, but he was poor and didn't get a chance. He had to work like a dog from the age of 12 and it embittered him his whole life. It made a brute out of him in many ways. In Richard Collins' literary portrait, he says that Nick Fante, after working hard to build the dream he had had for his family in America, and it not materialising in the way he had envisioned, became even more bitter. He would gamble to try and make money, and when pressures got to him, he was prone to the temptations of both wine and other women. In the early 1930s, John Fante had written that, My family went to smithereens a couple of years ago, my father beating it in one direction, and my ma and we kids to California. It was awful. And so, it seems like this is the period in Fante's life that was taken as inspiration for his debut novel. However, if we take the phrase here, a couple of years ago, as accurate, it seems like Fante was much older when this happened to him than Arturo is in Wait Until Spring Bandini. So, knowing what we know about Nick and Mary Fante, let's take a look at Arturo's parents in Wait Until Spring Bandini. His father Svevo, for example, was a pure Italian, of peasant stock that went back deeply into the generations. Yet he, now that he had citizenship papers, never regarded himself as an Italian. No, he was an American. Sometimes sentiment buzzed in his head and he liked to yell his pride of heritage, but for all sensible purposes he was an American. And when Maria spoke to him what the American women were doing and wearing, when she mentioned the activity of a neighbour, that American woman down the street, it infuriated him. For he was highly sensitive to the distinction of class and race, to the suffering it entailed, and he was bitterly against it. He was a bricklayer, and to him there was not a more sacred calling upon the face of the earth. You could be a king, you could be a conqueror, but no matter what you were, you had to have a house, and if you had any sense at all, it would be a brick house. Meanwhile, Arturo's mother, Maria, she had her own way of escape, her own passage into contentment, her rosary, that string of white beads, her quiet flight out of the world. She was away, she was free, she was no longer Maria, American or Italian, poor or rich, with or without electric washing machines and vacuum cleaners. Here was the land of all possessing. Hail Mary, Hail Mary, over and over, a thousand times and a hundred thousand times. It was for this that she lived. Maria worries about her family. She especially worries about her husband, his past and his friendships. She prayed for Svevo Bandini, prayed that he would not get too drunk and fall into the hands of the police as he had done on one occasion before their marriage. She prayed that he would stay away from Rocco Sacconi and that Rocco Sacconi would stay away from him. She prayed for the quickening of time, that the snow might melt and spring hurry to Colorado, that Svevo could go back to work again. She prayed for a happy Christmas and for money. She prayed for Arturo that he would stop stealing dimes, and for August that he might become a priest, and for Federico that he might be a good boy. 
As for the Rocco mentioned here, he and Svevo were childhood friends, dating back to their time in Italy, and they had, quote, known women together. Maria resents their relationship and what she sees as his influence in her life. Another passage says, When Rocco came to the house, he and Svevo had a way of drinking and laughing together without speaking, of muttering provincial Italian dialect and then laughing uproariously, a violent language of grunts and memories, teeming with implication, yet meaningless and always of a world in which he had never belonged and could never belong. What Bandini had done before his marriage she pretended not to care, but this Rocco Sacconi with his dirty laughter which Bandini enjoyed and shared was a secret out of the past that she longed to capture. In terms of literary significance though, it's not Svevo, Maria or Rocco that has made this the first episode of this podcast, it's that Wait Until Spring Bandini is the world's first introduction to the character of Arturo Bandini. In the Fante literary portrait, it is noted that, when Fante was young, the conductor Arturo Toscanini was a household name in America. Before he left Italy, he was called the greatest conductor in the world by Mussolini, and once he reached America, he became the first music director of the NBC Symphony Orchestra, and was of particular significance to Italian-Americans. So there's a possibility that this is where the inspiration for the name Arturo came from. As for the character of Arturo, well, according to Joyce Fante, quote, John was Arturo Bandini, and Arturo Bandini was John. Despite at this time having already written the unpublished Road to Los Angeles, which featured a teenage Arturo Bandini, when the writer Ben Pleasance asked John Fante if he saw Wait Until Spring Bandini as the start of a saga, Fante, surprisingly, said no. As a reader, we first hear about Arturo before we meet him. £150 was the weight of Svevo Bandini, and he had a son named Arturo who loved to touch his round shoulders and feel for the snakes inside. Svevo is now walking home and Arturo was 14 and owned a sled. As he, Svevo, turned into the yard of his house that was not paid for, his feet suddenly raced for the tops of the trees, and he was lying on his back, and Arturo's sled was still in motion. He had told that boy, that little bastard, to keep his sled out of the front walk. We soon meet Arturo himself. His name was Arturo, but he hated it and wanted to be called John. His last name was Bandini, and he wanted it to be Jones. His mother and father were Italians, but he wanted to be an American. His father was a bricklayer, but he wanted to be a pitcher for the Chicago Cubs. They lived in Rockland, Colorado, population 10,000, but he wanted to live in Denver, 30 miles away. His face was freckled, but he wanted it to be clear. He went to a Catholic school, but he wanted to go to a public school. This dissatisfaction in himself and his situation and his background is the root of one of Arturo's defining recurring characteristics throughout the Bandini novels, his daydreaming and his visions of himself as a great and noble hero. For example, when he visits the cinema, He was positive that his own face bore a striking resemblance to that of Robert Powell, and he was equally sure that the face of Gloria Borden bore an amazing resemblance to the wonderful Rosa. Gradually, Robert Powell lost his identity and became Arturo Bandini, and gradually Gloria Borden metamorphosed into Rosa Pinelli. After the big airplane crack-up with Rosa lying on the operating table, and none other than Arturo Bandini performing a precarious operation to save her life, the boy in the front seat broke into a sweat. Poor Rosa. But he knew he had a feeling all along that young Dr. Arturo Bandini would achieve a medical miracle, and sure enough, it happened. Before he knew it, the handsome doctor was kissing Rosa. It was springtime, and the world was beautiful. Up until this point in Fante's writing career, the Catholic Church, and the confession booth in particular, had featured heavily in his writing. Here, Arturo, despite his religious upbringing and surroundings, isn't really a God-fearing child. Arturo Bandini was pretty sure that he wouldn't go to hell when he died. The way to hell was the committing of mortal sin. He had committed many, he believed, but the confessional had saved him. He always got to confession on time, that is, before he died, and he knocked on wood whenever he thought of it. He would always get there on time, before he died. So Arturo was pretty sure he wouldn't go to hell when he died for two reasons, the confessional and the fact that he was a fast runner. However, Arturo, now entering puberty, does have one weakness, girls. Quote, after his twelfth year, the only things in life that mattered were baseball and girls. Only he called them women. He liked the sound of the word. Women. 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 He said it over and over because it was a secret sensation. He only begins to understand the severity of his obsession when he discovers the sin of adultery. The man who told him about adultery wasn't Father Andrew, and it wasn't one of the nuns, but Art Montgomery at the standard station on the corner. From that day on, his loins were a thousand angry hornets buzzing in a nest. He could not beat it. He couldn't go to the movies anymore because he only went to the movies to see the shapes of his heroines. He liked love pictures. He liked following girls up the stairs. He liked girls' arms, legs, hands, feet, their shoes and stockings and dresses, their smell and their presence. Every week he staggered into the church of a Saturday afternoon, weighted down by the sins of adultery. Of course, there's one girl in particular that occupies Arturo's mind. Quote, 
He watched from the door, feasting his eyes upon the triumph of her tiptoed loveliness. Rosa, tinfoil and chocolate bars, the smell of a new football, goalposts with bunting, a home run with the bases full. I am an Italian too, Rosa. Look, and my eyes are like yours, Rosa. I love you. Arturo feels an affinity for Rosa because she was, quote, poor too, a coal miner's daughter, but they flocked around her and listened to her talk. Winter was already bad enough for Arturo without baseball to keep him going, but Christmas time in particular, being from a poor family, weighed on Arturo even more. Strange time, Christmas coming, the town full of Christmas trees and the Santa Claus men from the Salvation Army ringing bells. Only three more shopping days before Christmas. They stood with famine-stricken eyes before shop windows. They sighed and walked on. But he lied with the rest of them. What was he getting for Christmas? Oh, a new watch, a new suit. A lot of shirts and ties, a new bicycle, and a dozen sporting official National League baseballs. Yet still, the other main focus of Arturo's attention, regardless of the season, is his father. As I mentioned earlier, Nick Fante was known to be led astray from his family, and yet, despite this, the dedication for this novel still comes with love and admiration for Nick Fante. Similarly, Svevo's transgressions don't necessarily dampen Arturo's admiration for him. If anything, at times they enhance it. Arturo sees the fact that Svevo has won a wealthy woman as a victory. Quote, The woman was driving, and the man had his arm at her back. He felt like laughing. It was such a strange thing. Effie Hildegard drove the car, and the man was Svevo Bandini, that father of his. That's Svevo Bandini. Oh boy, his father was a wonder, and he was like his father. In terms of style, Wait Until Spring Bandini does stand out in the Bandini Chronicles. It has only ten chapters overall, each much longer in length than those of, say, Ask the Dust. Similarly, it's the only novel written in third person, and in which Arturo is arguably not the focus of the novel, with Svevo really being the focal point of the events of the plot, if not necessarily the emotional core of the novel. Writing the book, Fante was deliberately shifting up his style after being disheartened with the reaction to Road to Los Angeles, which had been rejected. We'll go into this more in our next episode, but it was this book, The Road to Los Angeles, which Fante said he had written in, quote, fearful honesty. He added that, having seen it be rejected, he realised, quote, it's a poor policy to be honest, and it is much better to be artistic. If, as Joyce Fante said, Arturo was John and John was Arturo, by shifting the focus away from solely Arturo, it would have made the writing of Spring slightly less personal. And in this way, it was a success, as this was the novel that got Fante published. Ultimately, despite the shift in focus, the book is still mainly about the dynamic between Arturo and his father, and it is Arturo who eventually manages to bring his father back home. The final straw for Svevo coming after Effie Hildegard begins insulting Arturo and his dog, calling them peasants, saying, you foreigners, you're all alike, you and your dogs and all of you. As Svevo and Arturo walk home together, Svevo says, pretty soon we'll have spring. We sure will, says Arturo. When Ben Pleasance asked Fante about the critical response to Wait Until Spring Bandini, Fante said, I do know that in the Chicago Tribune bestseller list, my book was among the first five all the time. He said that, overall, he remembered that the response was very good. Critics loved it. A guy by the name of Joseph Henry Jackson, a critic for the San Francisco Chronicle, boosted it to the sky, and he made it a success in California. I put that word success in quotation marks because it truly didn't have a great success, but critically it was very successful. Of course, in terms of how and why this moderately well-received novel from 1938 is still being read today, there's still a lot of ground to cover, and we'll go into that in our next episodes. As a footnote, there is a movie of Wait Until Spring Bandini, which was released in November 1989 and stars, among others, Faye Dunaway. Prior to Wait Until Spring Bandini, director Dominique Derrudaire had directed just one film, 1987's Crazy Love, based in part on writings by Charles Bukowski. He had to cut down his original plans for shooting the film after having difficulty raising the required budget. Completing the film was something of a personal triumph for the director, who had insisted that he would not be, quote, an employee of Hollywood. And in doing so, he turned down a $15 million offer from American producers to direct the film but relinquish his final say. He rejected the offer, saying that Hollywood wanted to make the film, quote, too sweet. I wanted to make an emotional film, he said, not a tearjerker. As it goes, I think it's not a bad movie, and certainly not the worst Fante adaptation put on film, but if you're listening to this and somehow still unfamiliar with Wait Until Spring Bandini, the novel itself is really the only true way to get a sense of the Bandini family and the work and feel and craft of John Fante. And, once you're done with Wait Until Spring Bandini, I'd recommend diving straight into The Road to Los Angeles, which we'll be looking at in our next episode. Music